All right, so let's talk about the fight that you're working this weekend. Detroit, Michigan, Little Caesars Arena, Clarissa Shields against uh, Vanessa Joannis. That's a fight you can watch live on DAZN. So, Corey, correct me. This is now Clarissa's – she has the potential to become a five-division champion with this win because she's already a belt holder, undisputed champion at 54 – 60 and 68 this fight is for a vacant 175 pound belt and the heavyweight belt that currently vanessa joannis possesses correct that is correct yeah so if it counted for sugar ray leonard we're gonna count it for clarissa shields wow okay all right we're doing that we're doing <laughs> sugar ray donnie lalonde references right that's, now. that's basically what's happening here isn't what it talking about here. um what do you make of it? this is like it's 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 not unique, obviously, we just mentioned Ray and, and Donnie, but it is exceedingly rare to have two belts on the line. And look, the heavyweight in the men's side, heavyweight belt is everything, right? Like that's the the pinnacle of boxing. On the women's side, I think there's only like 22, 23 heavyweight women's boxers that are active. So there's not a lot, understandably. Like it's just a different uh, demographic. Um, what... What's interesting about this fight to you? Well, I, I think with Clarissa, she's been so dominant for so long uh, that the story of her career has basically been chasing competition. And that has brought her to different weight classes, moving up and down. And she's found that uh, there hasn't been any competition for her. Savannah Marshall has basically been the closest to it. And then the knockdown that she suffered against Hannah Gabriels before dominating the rest of the fight that has really been her competition as a pro. And looking at the landscape anywhere in that weight neighborhood that you described, where she has held titles in the past between 54 and 68, as of right now, as we speak, that competition really isn't out there for her, you know, say for a rematch against Savannah Marshall, but it's less palatable because we've seen it already. So what she's chasing right now is accomplishments and she's chasing events and I think we have to be realistic with what it is that she's chasing right now. Vanessa Lepage on this has not fought anyone the caliber of Clarissa Shields. Um, she had a, a nice competitive win over Abril Vidal to win that WBC heavyweight title, but she hasn't faced anyone close to Shields' caliber. But for Shields, I mean, the, the cachet of winning a heavyweight title, of being able to main event again uh, at the big arena in Detroit... Uh, and, and, you know, you add in the, the title at 175 as well. Uh, that's really what she can chase right now. There's really nothing else out there for her but for there to be uh, trinkets, accomplishments, and events. And this one satisfies all of those things. Yeah, and look, her last three fights, she has main evented at O2 Arena against Savannah Marshall. Uh, last time out was last June, which was against Marcella Corneo. That was originally supposed to be Hannah Gabriel's, which would have been a more interesting fight to the public at large because of that knockdown that you referenced. And now against uh, Joannis, the uh, heavyweight champion, uh, she's headlining once again. It'll do a good crowd. There aren't a lot of women out there that are doing those kinds of crowds. I, I just wondered, like, when this was announced – like one of my first thoughts was maybe Clarissa would consider going down in weight, right? Like we all saw the altercation she had with Alicia Baumgartner uh, months ago, right? And, you know, Baumgartner is a much, much smaller woman. But, you know, Baumgartner had said, I can make 147, which she probably could. Um, I wondered if Clarissa could go down to 147. That would be the kind of interesting fight that would captivate, I think, a larger audience. Now, she is kind of in that phase, right? Where it's all about let's become as decorated a fighter in these four or five weight classes as I possibly can. Because Corey, she's just 29 years old. Like her career is in its prime. Um, but as I look around, I, I don't know what that interesting fight is. Like, I think you could make a Savannah Marshall rematch somewhat interesting. Um, it, it could happen in the cage. I mean, that's that's a, another There's possibility yeah. there. But um, as far as boxing goes, like there's not great depth that heavyweight to create a rival for Clarissa Shields. Um, yeah, I know her and Franchon Cruz Desern have talked about fighting again, but both of them have said they want a big bag for it. I don't think there is a big bag out there for that 
rematch. Those two fought in Clarissa's, uh, and I think it was also uh, Franch John's pro debut years and years ago. Um, so, like, I, I just don't know what, like, she's she's incredibly skilled. She's incredibly decorated already with the gold medals and the the uh, world championships. It's just like, how does she capitalize on that? Like, when you're in the smaller weight classes, you have one, maybe two rivals, right? Like, Katie Taylor had Chantel Cameron and Amanda Serrano. Those are rivals that could take her into the twilight of her career. Um, you know, Baumgartner had Michaela Mayer and, you know, who knows, might have a Sky Nicholson or even a Serrano in the, in the years uh, ahead. You know, those lower weight classes, you have organic rivals emerge. Not many of them, but you have a few of them. Clarissa is just, I, I just don't know where it is. I, you know, I know she does mixed martial arts. She dabbles in PFL, but her skill set's far more conducive to, to boxing. She's a much better boxer than she is a mixed martial artist. I, I just don't know how, how her promoter, Dimitri Salida, her manager, Mark Taffet, how do they generate the kind of events that Clarissa wants, uh, that, that she believes she deserves? That's a big challenge to me. I don't know where, where, where that, uh, how that, that is generated. Yeah, and I think it's kind of on a fight by fight basis right now. Like I think that this, like I said, I think this satisfies kind of what you would want out of a Clarissa fight right now. I mean, you're going to get the crowd, you're going to get the spectacle, and you'll get the headlines of potentially winning two more belts and then that heavyweight crown. Um, it is one of the the tragedies of Shields's career that she won't, especially now that Marshall has been vanquished, that she won't necessarily have. Uh, you know, that bundle of rivals to be chasing her uh, all the while. I think that 147 was probably going to be a very, very uncomfortable, uncomfortable weight cut for her. Uh, Shields has talked about in between fights, at least in between one of her fights, getting up to above 200. Yeah. So you think about a fighter coming down from like 202 to 147, that could potentially be perilous. And if you are thinking about longevity and sticking around for a little while, as you mentioned, she's 29 years old, you could stretch this out a little longer. Do you really want to melt down, do something potentially hazardous for the short term that might, you know, might have consequences down the road or maybe in the immediate that could, that could jeopardize what you could build for a long time? I think that this is a lot safer for her in terms of her body. I think that Clarissa probably she's not really going to have to cut any weight. She can just kind of train and fight comfortably without having to worry about cutting uh, any additional poundage, but go in and win two potential titles. Like, I think that this is a good move for her. Um, and I think that Clarissa's legacy in women's boxing, I mean, it already is as one of really the two women that really kicked the doors open for a lot of other women like the the emergence of Clarissa and Katie Taylor changed everything even for fighters like Sinisa Estrada or Amanda Serrano who were doing their thing and were successful prior to them excuse me they then got additional opportunities because of kind of the interest that women's boxing accrued because of these two major figures and perhaps you know this is maybe a bigger dream but the emergence of Clarissa Shields as a heavyweight and making a heavyweight a, a thing in women's boxing, maybe you start to draw in athletes of different sorts, uh, larger athletes, bigger athletes, the types of athletes that you would see in the WNBA. On the undercard, we're going to see Danielle Perkins come back as well. Danielle Perkins was a pro women's basketball player who then converted to boxing, won a national amateur championship, medaled at the world uh, amateur championships as well, is now making a run of it at, at uh, in the pros. You wonder what the women's boxing landscape could look like if you get those types of athletes en masse coming to the sport of boxing and perhaps Clarissa's emergence in this weight class could start a wave of that also, you know, and then on the back end of her career, she could open additional doors. That's going to be so tough though, unless you are like, if you have the skill set to be a basketball player, uh, the basketball money in the women's games only going up. I and mean, we just saw the new TV rights deal North of uh, rights deal North of $2 billion for the WNBA in its new deal. That's only going to continue to grow in the years ahead. It's like the, it's the same problem, frankly, that men's boxing is having with the heavyweight division. Like look at the men's landscape at heavyweight. Like Jared Anderson is there as far as us men go. Who else is there? Like who is that next big man 
in men's boxing. Like they're all playing other sports because other sports are a safer and B potentially a lot more lucrative with a lot more opportunity to play them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are some women that are 160 pounds and up that are inspired by Clarissa that are probably in the gym right now. Um, you know, that you know, trying to get better, trying to get on that level. But I think you're still gonna have the same problem that you run into with uh the the other options out there are more appealing to them uh than boxing and and certainly more palatable to them in terms of how you not having to get hit in the face, you know, been playing uh, <laughs> uh basketball. I think for Clarissa, as I look ahead to this fight, and I'm sure you've studied uh, her opponent and, and you've covered her fights recently a lot. Um, I think she's got to go out there and try to get her out of there fast. Like she's just so much better, like full stop. So much better. Like the, this woman, uh, Vanessa has been knocked out before granted. It was by, uh, was it Jimenez mm -hmm. uh, who eventually popped positive for a banned substance later on. And that fight was at like, they're in the two thirties for that fight. Like that was, that's another thing. Like she's going from weighing like two thirty something to what? one seventy five whatever for this, this title fight. It's crazy. That's a crazy drop in weight. Um, but like if Clarissa wants to make a statement and wants to keep her name in the news cycle and keep her name, you know, front and center in boxing, she's got to go out there and try to stop this girl. And I think Clarissa can, I think she can crack a little bit. Like, you know, I remember her last fight against Corneo. Corneo was a tough woman. Clarissa landed some good shots. Like she's got some power uh, in those hands, but she's got to go off for the opening round and try to get this girl out of there. Because I, I just don't think Corey, uh, a 10 round, 190 all three scorecards got to do anything for her. It, it's not going to get her the kind of paydays she's growing accustomed to draw the kind of crowds she's growing accustomed to and be in the kind of events she's growing accustomed to uh, moving forward. Yeah. And, and I guess the argument is if she doesn't, doesn't she just kind of wind up in the same place that she's right now, which is still a pretty good spot. Right. But I think what you're suggesting is that if for Clarissa to hit another level, yeah, like having that viral clip of her at heavyweight scoring a knockout in this fight, obviously yeah. that would be a little bit of a boost, but like, I guess like it's difficult having called, you know, a lot of Shields fights in the past and, and having covered her basically since the the amateur days and, and knowing her, um, you know, since she was like a 16 year old or so. Uh, it's hard because like it gets tiresome to like reduce her fights down to just to distill them to like knock out or not. But that also speaks to how good she is, too. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's almost not a question of whether she's going to win heading into a fight. It's just whether she could get this crazy knockout clip that we could share. Uh, and, and it's difficult. But I do think that, you know, if we are going to uh, stay on that talking point, I think there's a good chance that she could get it here. And it's not not necessarily because of the uh, the level of opposition. I think that Lepajo and Nice is in and around the level of a, of a Cornejo or, or other fighters. I think it's without that weight cut that Clarissa has to worry about. Clarissa just at her walk around weight, feeling her absolute strongest. How will that impact her punching power? I think that that is something to watch for in this fight. You mentioned we're not at the point of wondering whether or not she's going to win. As of right now, according to DraftKings, she is a minus 3,000 favorite in this fight. Minus 3,000. That sure. is a, that's the kind of odds you see on deep undercard types of fights. So it is kind of like, can you showcase uh, the kind of power some people are looking for and produce you know, a knockout in a fight like this? And, and we'll see. That's what I'll be watching for. Like, I'm not expecting her opponent to to be in any kind of contention here. Like, I'm just not. I'm expecting her to to get beat, but how she gets beat is what I'm most interested in uh, for the Caressa. Uh, real quick, before I let you go, some breaking news on the 130-pound uh, men's title front where we've got a, the WBC ordering uh, Ropes and Kinsaisau to defend his belt that he won probably unfairly against Oshaki Foster. Um, Corey, I beat up on sanctioning bodies a lot on this show, so credit to WBC, uh, where it's due, uh, ordering this particular fight. I'm going to shock you, Foster. I don't care what Bob Arum says. I don't care how many times you watch that fight back. There's no way can say so I won that fight. No way. Oshaki Foster won pretty clean and deserves to get this immediate rematch. So credit to them. Uh, I think would think you agree. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think that this is one of the things that sanctioning bodies ought to do, right? Like if you're thinking uh, ideally, what should a sanctioning body do? It should have... Uh, you know, some degree of influence over how these bad decisions are handled on the back end. Now, this obviously doesn't remedy, 
any of the other root causes. You know, it doesn't it doesn't punish the judges who uh, levied the incorrect decision, but it does ensure that the the fighter who was wronged has an opportunity to make up for it. We can't give Oshaki Foster that night back, but we can put basically force top rank and force Kinsaitiao to have to run this back and give Foster that opportunity again. And, uh, you know, outside of uh, punishing the judges that levied that decision in the first place, this is about as much as you could ask for from a sanctioning body. And while you're at it, order Benavidez and Canelo, and then we'll be cool, WBC. Uh, yeah. Check out, Corey, this Saturday, Little Caesars Arena, live on DAZN, Clarissa Shields bids to become the women's heavyweight champion of the world. Corey, good luck, and uh, good stuff as always, my man. Au revoir.